afternoon. My name is Nicole Mousen with Engage Bay. Today, we're very excited to continue our interview series where we sit down with influential names in sales and marketing. For the third episode of this series, our guest is prolific blogger and entrepreneur Ryan Robinson. Ryan acts as a mentor to thousands of aspiring bloggers worldwide. His work has been featured in Forbes, Entrepreneur, Fast Company, Business Insider, Lifehacker, and many, many more. As a writer, part-time entrepreneur, and content marketing consultant, Ryan has worked with Fortune 500 brands and top startups such as LinkedIn, Google, Adobe, Intuit, Creative Live, Zendesk, Oracle, and so many more. So we're really looking forward to talking to him. And without further ado, here's Ryan Robinson. Ryan, how are you today? I'm great. Thank you very much for having me. You're so welcome. All right. So the first question I want to ask you is, I want to know a little bit more about you. Uh, I know that you've done a lot of products such as iStash and Case Escape, and now you're a pretty high profile blogger. So how did you get to that point? <laughs> you did your homework. Um, yeah. <laughs> the iStash is a funny one. That was kind of my very first little side project. Um, but I, you know, drawing kind of a line, a thread through everything. Um, I've always worked on different side businesses over the years. So this goes back to when I was in college um, 10 years ago, actually now. Um, and so, yeah, the iStash was my first project. And then I kind of started my blog um, about six years ago now, sort of breaking down, you know, first article was why the iStash failed. Um, so that kind of theme has been consistent throughout the years of like breaking down different side projects I've done, um, case escape, like how that business grew, um, what we did to get, you know, traffic to our site over there. Um, mm -hmm. and then, you know, also my journey through freelancing on the side of my day job. So a lot of kind of just, um, stories, lessons learned, advice, um, things not to do, <laughs> um, is how my blog kind of got started. And I saw what people were interested in and, uh, kept kind of, uh, fueling both my own interests and theirs with content. Okay. So what made you decide to start a blog? You already had a full-time job when you did, right? So what yeah, was the exactly. inspiration? Honestly, like it was one person that I went to college with asking me lots and lots of questions about how I was making the iStash product. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, I kind of like had this idea of, man, I'm going to forget this stuff over time if I don't write this down too. So I was kind of just documenting my own sort of process, um, you know, something as as complex as like getting a product manufactured overseas um, mm -hmm. it was very, very different 10 years ago um, than it is today with like Alibaba and such. So it was, it was kind of a fun process of just um, answering the questions that people were asking me. Okay. Can you tell the audience a little bit about your products? Yeah. Yeah. The first one, iStash um, is no longer purchasable, but if you Google iStash, I've got an article on my blog kind of talking through that story. Um, but it was essentially kind of an, an iPhone lookalike um, hide your anything device. So it was like a, a stash designed to hold, you know, cigarette shaped objects um, as you go into concerts, music festivals, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and that product did surprisingly well from a sales perspective. I think I sold um, a little under 7,000 of them. Wow. Uh, some went to and like coffee shops in Amsterdam, like a very cool for, for a, you know, 19 year old college kid at the time. Um, but ultimately I ended up losing money on it overall. There was just too, too expensive of a product to manufacture for the price point that people were willing to pay for it. Um, mm -hmm. So that was a really good lesson. Um, and then, yeah, case escape was kind of my next like product business. Um, where we were selling both cases through sites like um, Etsy, um, Shop and Be, um, but then also we were selling kind of the the make your own case kit. So we were selling like the printers, the blank cases, the inks that you needed to to print people's images on or designs onto cases and sell your own online. Um, and so that was kind of a cool, fun business that my my partner from that is actually still continuing on with today. And and we parted ways with that business when I moved to San Francisco and took a job um, doing marketing for tech companies. Okay. So today you really help a lot of people learn how to, you know, make a really successful blog and how to monetize it. But how tough was it for you when you first started out? I mean, I started out like everyone else with zero readers um, aside from my mom. Um, and then, you know, friends, friends I had from college, people that were, I was connections with on LinkedIn. Um, so it really was like, you know, um, I would say even more difficult from a tech standpoint. Mm -hmm. 
back like eight, eight years ago, seven years ago, when I first kind of started tinkering around with my blog. Um, it was a Tumblr blog back then before okay. I switched over to WordPress. <laughs> um, and so even WordPress was more basic. Like the, the themes that were available weren't as like great from like a visual editing standpoint. So I'd say the, the tools have come a very long way um, since those days. But you know, the thing that, that has always been a challenge is like how to drive traffic and how to get, um, you know, landed guest posts or columns on these other sites that already have tons of readers that you can like kind of draw from um, over time. And so that's been something that I'm always learning and iterating on and, and kind of, you know, sticking with my theme here, trying to share that journey super, super publicly as I go. So do you think a blogger should focus on a specific niche or do you think they should just write more general content? I always recommend people focus on a specific niche. Um, and I think the, that kind of hypothesis is also being um, validated with Google these days. Mm -hmm. that Google's pushed out a couple of really big search algorithm updates um, that seem to, at least right now, favor sites that are like very niche authoritative um, in their search ranking. So, you know, like um, if you publish only about like freelancing, um, chances are you're going to rank high for freelancing related terms in Google search. If you're like publishing, you know, long form in depth content, spending time promoting it, building links to it through guest posting. Um, if you do all the right things and you stick with a kind of a cohesive niche, a theme that you can be perceived as an expert at, um, that's going to be your best shot to uh, achieving everything you would want to achieve with a blog, building a brand, um, you know, getting booked for speaking gigs, uh, getting freelance clients, um, getting traffic that ranks high and you can, you know, generate income from whether through ads or sponsored posts, affiliates, um, you know, your own course sales. So that's definitely my advice. Niche down, focus on a specific thing that you can authentically um, show your expertise at. Okay. So what would your advice be for small businesses starting a blog? Um, I think it, it kind of depends on what the business is and where your business is located. Um, so I'd be hesitant to give like super blanket advice, but I think it's, it's important to kind of take stock first of what your most important keyword phrases are. So what are the most meaningful things that people are searching for on Google that you could possibly rank for in order to drive more business? So if you're you know, like a, a local business, like if you're a florist in, um, let's just say Los Angeles, California, um, how important is it that you would rank number one for like, you know, Los Angeles florist or, um, you mm -hmm. know, wedding florals, um, Silver Lake, right? Like a, a neighborhood of Los Angeles that you might be in. Um, so picking out these kinds of things, doing some keyword research too, um, to figure out how many people are searching for these types of terms online, um, is where I would definitely start. Um, because you want to publish content that people are actually searching for answers about. You don't want to just like mm -hmm. shout into the void and sing your own praises. Um, I think you want to provide real value to people out there that are looking for answers. Okay. So um, let's talk more about startups using a blog. Um, what kind of content marketing do you think they need? Like what would you recommend? That's a good question. I think it's, it's another one of those it depends kinds of answers. Um, but mm -hmm. today I still see text-based content, so long form articles, uh, mm -hmm. kind of being rewarded the most as far as what search engines are surfacing. Um, mm -hmm. I think there's kind of an increased focus and will continue to be more of an emphasis on video content. Um, mm -hmm. So I think video is, is definitely like long-term going to be a smart investment to begin making today. So publishing, you know, with each blog post, if you publish something once a week or every other week, like just include a video with that. Um, it's an additional traffic source. YouTube's the number two search engine in the world right behind Google. So playing to both of those would be super smart. And then, I mean, depending upon what your kind of business is, what your product or service is, um, you could also get a lot of results by being active on Instagram um, or maybe your audience spends time on Twitter or LinkedIn if it's professionals. Um, so I would say just really take inventory of like who your audience is and how they want to be engaged with. If they're like audiophiles, maybe they love podcasts, right? If someone's listening to podcasts every day, mm -hmm. chances are if you can create a podcast about things they're interested in, then that's going to be a good way to acquire more people too. Okay. Do you think infographics have a role as well? 
I'd say hell yeah. Um, for all of my most valuable articles on my blog, I do commission infographics too. Um, cause I think it's, it's one of those things where, you know, people will consume content in different um, ways and, or will best consume content in different ways. So while some may want to read a 10,000 word article, um, some people would rather go through an infographic that kind of like visually breaks that down. So I think appealing to the visual learners, you know, the audio learners by having like a um, maybe an audio version of your blog post. Um, and mm -hmm. then, yeah, I, I think diversifying your content mediums is always smart. Okay. You mentioned social media a little bit. Um, what do you think the best social media platforms are for B2B businesses for promoting content? For promoting content would be the, the important caveat there. I think LinkedIn has kind of become a void that a lot of people just shout into lately. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm, that's, that's my only hesitancy. I'm not sure of like how valuable LinkedIn really is these days for content promotion. I think there are people doing, doing unique things there that do stand out. Um, but they, the platform itself seems to have tried to do a lot to like not rank articles in people's feeds or not rank, um, updates in people's feeds that have links in them. So maybe coming up with a content strategy that's more about for LinkedIn, at least more about like engaging people, getting them to comment and share your status, um, answer questions on your status. Like that's, that's what I would see working well for LinkedIn, um, which has otherwise kind of for the past couple of years been the best like social network, I would say for, for B2Bs. Okay. Um, do you recommend Facebook or Twitter at all? You know, personally speaking, I don't use Facebook much at all for my own businesses. So I'd okay, that's interesting. give much there, but, but Twitter. Yeah, for sure. I think if you're, if your strategy is um, at, at all involved connecting with people that are like executives at, at, um, startups, if you're selling some sort of product to those types of people, I think that's a great place to engage with them. Yeah. Okay. Is there any reason you've moved away from Facebook? I just personally um, get like overwhelmed with the Facebook experience myself. And so I like, I have this like visceral reaction to like not want to like see the notifications or like mm -hmm. uh, get too invested in like publishing updates. Um, and I, I also feel like it's sort of like you know, maybe this is like a generational thing, but it's the audience um, has skewed a little bit older um, and isn't really as much like the, the readers that I find um, who are spending time on my blog. Um, more of them are on Twitter these days. Okay, that's really interesting. So with so many blogs out there in the world, um, where do you think content fits in today's marketing landscape? Hmm. I mean, I still think content is king. It's probably it's definitely my best way of acquiring customers um, and subscribers mm. for my blog. Um, so for me, I'm a huge proponent of regularly publishing. I'm trying to up my publishing to like three times a week now. Um, mm -hmm. But I think for most businesses, it's also a way to, you know, not only attract customers, but also move people through the buying process. So you can create educational content that, you know, walks someone through your sales process, essentially, whether they, whether they know it or not, you can be answering questions that kind of like builds a relationships, um, you know, and establishes more trust, um, positions you as like the best source for um, a product or service that can help answer their needs. And so I think that's, there's content can be plugged in at various different stages of the sales funnel. Okay. Um, in terms of publishing, publishing schedules, what, like, what do you recommend or does it vary from business to business? It does. Yep. That's another, it depends. Um, in my uh, opinion, at least, um, today I, I know I have a very clear idea of what I need to do as far as, um, you know, publishing goals. And so I think as you grow over time, you learn what works best for you. Um, but I wouldn't start with publishing three times a week. Um, yeah. I think if you're, if you're publishing once a week, that's a lot. Um, and mm. most people, if it's every other week, then that's good. I think if you're, if you're doing long form content in particular, um, you should be spending a week on just creating an asset that's, you know, a few thousand words long and incorporates an infographic and maybe some other like custom graphics and an audio version or a video to go along with it. Um, it's a lot of work. It sounds like a lot of work. It is. <laughs> yeah. So I think you've got to allow the time to actually do that and do it well because it's, Content marketing is, is like a race to the top of the mountain today in terms of 
the amount of quality and, um, you know, value people are going to deliver for free, right? So Mm -hmm. you have to stand out from the other people out there trying to attract the same audience. So how do you get, you know, attention from Google? How do you get ranked on the first page in your opinion? If I were to try and distill it down to one thing or a small number of things, I think the the most valuable thing that people should be doing today is getting high quality natural backlinks. So that doesn't mean like buying links from some sort of service. Um, It doesn't mean doing like shady things to get your article linked to on like really old, um, you know, web blogs. But I think getting links through being interviewed on podcasts or going on like kind of a video tour um, on people's YouTube channels, um, doing guest posts, um, creating it. This is a really good strategy, creating an infographic um, that can be shared on other blogs that have the same kind of like readership base. You can Mm -hmm. really interesting infographic to share on your site. And then hit up, you know, 10 other blogs who might be interested in sharing that infographic with their audience. So that's, that's a cool tactic um, called guesto graphics that Brian Dean likes to do a lot. Um, okay. Blog back Linko. So he's got a huge epic article talking ex- exactly about how to pull that strategy off that I would highly recommend checking out because um, I've had a lot of success with it too. Definitely. So let's say you're a small business and you're starting a blog and you have no idea what to write about. What what are the steps you would follow to come up with content? Well, shameless plug, I have an article (laughs) on my blog about the 101 um, most interesting blog post ideas. And it's Mm -hmm. rather than just like copy paste ideas, it's more a framework to think about how you should be coming up with blog post ideas. And so, you know, just for example, perusing like a couple of them, um, you know, talking about something like, what's your schedule? Um, if you're, if your content's going to be about like productivity or being, um, you know, productive in the workplace, like breaking down what your day looks like, giving readers a, a glimpse into how you manage your calendar. That's kind of one idea. Um, but essentially like I, I would really think about it as, um, kind of a process of examining what your audience's biggest pain points are. So right. what are their biggest challenges? Um, and then, you know, one example, if your product is a CRM, your product is for salespeople, right? And they want to sell more of whatever they're selling. That's the biggest thing that you can help them solve. And so one company that's done, uh, and, and client that's done a really good uh, job of this example is Close. It's a CRM and their CEO, Steli, does like a weekly video series that breaks down some sort of sales related question he's been asked essentially Um, by salespeople and then there's a blog post that goes along with it and um, yeah I think you can kind of combine that like answering questions your audience has with doing actual keyword research so using a tool like Moz or Ahrefs um, to research what exactly people are searching for as it relates to you know your topic that your business solves and then kind of prioritize those based on the number of searchers and then maybe kind of a, a qualifier of like how high is the purchase intent? Is this just something that people are going to read for 30 seconds and go away forever? Or is this something where people are actually, you know, evaluating a potential solution like what your business does? Okay. Do you always think that following the trends and writing what, you know, comes up high in keyword research is the right way to go? Not always. Um, I, I personally at least take the approach of trying to have some sort of balance, 50-50, 60-40 of pursuing clear keyword opportunities and then also things that I'm just personally interested in writing. Um, Okay. Usually usually there's an overlap there. Um, At least there should be if you're writing about the the right kinds of topics for your audience. There should be an overlap anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, Okay, so what kind of tools do you use for your content marketing? I'd say the, the tool I used most is Ahrefs, um, A-H-R-E-F-S.com. Yeah. It's just kind of a, yeah, keyword research, backlink research, um, gives you great analysis on where like your own traffic might be coming from um, if you're not a big Google Analytics fan. So personally speaking, I use Ahrefs like every single day for just figuring out ways that I can kind of like amplify my own traffic, get more links from my site. Um, 
but aside from that, like, I mean, gosh, I, I'm a huge proponent of free tools like Google Sheets, um, mm -hmm. spreadsheet for tracking like my editorial calendar, um, Trello for, for managing my content for my podcast. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I try and use free tools whenever I can. <laughs> okay. So what do you do like when you just run out of ideas? What like, you know, have you ever had writer's block? Have you ever just felt stuck? What have you done? Definitely have been there. Yes. Um, I'd say like the, the best way for me to come up with new ideas when I'm like totally out of it is to look at what other people are writing about. Um, okay. And then not just like copy paste, write about what this other person's covering, um, but see how that sparks ideas of my own. So how can I like, you know, go to the lifehacker.com homepage, see what articles are on their homepage. And then how can that like be tweaked to be something about side businesses um, or, you know, about blogging? Like how does this apply to blogging? Um, for me, that's kind of like how I try and think about it now. Okay. Um, what is your opinion on rewriting content? Like when do you think a post should be rewritten? How should it be rewritten? This is a tricky one. Um, I was just talking with someone else about this today. Um, the, the context of, or the concept of um, technical debt is one where, you know, like as a tech company, if you're building a product over the years and the years and the years, you build up like a huge backlog of code, right? And you mm -hmm. create technical debt. You can only make decisions based on all the tech that you've already built. Um, and I think content debt is this like concept of like, once you have a couple hundred posts on your blog, now have this huge responsibility to like update and rewrite content often if you want it to stay relevant and keep ranking in search engines. And so for me, I try and just prioritize, like how can I, um, you know, keep my most important keyword rankings high? And I think that's for me, it's kind of like I choose three to four articles to update um, each month. Um, okay. And that's sort of the rhythm that I get into personally. Um, I don't update everything. There's stuff in my blog that hasn't been touched for, you know, four years. Um, mm -hmm. But that's okay. If it was going after like a meaningful search term for my site, then I would update it. Okay. So are you a fan of gated or ungated content? Do you have a preference or which do you think is more useful? I do use both. Um, okay. But the way that I like to think about <clears throat> gated content is, if I'm going to do gated content, um, I want the ungated portion of that content to first be like head and shoulders above the rest of my competitors um, out there. So like an example of that is with my like guide on how to start a blog, um, I also have a free gated course um, that walks you through like kind of a seven day process for getting your blog um, like dialed in and, and getting your first post published. Um, but before I made that free course available, that gated course, um, I made sure my guide was like epically long in length. Today, it's like 25,000 words, I think. Um, okay. So it's almost a mini book, right? And yeah, that's, subject yeah. Is long, yes. Like, you know, between 2,000 and at the high end, 10,000 words. So mine is like, you know, a multiple two and a half above, above my like next competitor, essentially. Okay. So where do you think uh, SEO plays a role in content? Like, do you think it's a differentiator between what content is good versus bad? I do think so. Yeah. I think um, there's been a lot changing um, this year as far as SEO goes. So, you know, this, this answer may or may not be, be timely, but um, today what I'm seeing is that Google's placing a very like heavy influence or importance on sites that ha that match their EAT algorithm updates. And that's kind of the, the um, expertise, the authoritativeness and the trustworthiness of your okay. site. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm seeing, is, you know, as kind of a result of that is like um, having a blog that's about five different topics is not as good is having a blog that is a super expert, authoritative, and trustworthy on one specific niche topic. So okay. that's my advice like moving forward today is like if you can focus on just like one um, area to blog about, I think you're going to get a lot more like favorable attention and rankings from search engines. So where does ranking figure in when you're deciding what content to write? Hmm. I mean, I, I start with the goal of like for every piece I publish, wanting to be number one for that. Like that's my goal. 
I don't okay. sort of like think like, oh, I just want to be on the first page, um, especially if it's going to be a super long form article that's, you know, 10,000 words or plus, like I'm investing all that time so that I can rank number one. And that's kind of like my approach for, um, you know, having like five to 10 high value articles in the number one position at a time. So there's, there's stuff that I'll never rank for. Um, but it's a matter of deciding which articles are most important for me. And then I kind of accordingly place more work promoting those articles on those. Okay. So where do you think influencer marketing fits in with content? For me, influencer marketing has always been a part of my content promotion. Um, I, I try and involve, this is a really important thing, actually. I always involve influencers in the writing process. So Interesting. Okay. There's, there's one article on my blog that's a really good example of this. It's about business advice. Um, so it's 60 top entrepreneurs share their best business advice. Um, and before I compiled that post, I, I actually reached out to, I mean, to get 60 people to reply, probably a couple hundred. People. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and many of them were these huge fish that, that would never respond to like an email from, you know, little old me blogger. Um, but a crazy amount of people did respond. Like, um, got a quote from like Mark Cuban, Richard Branson, Arianne Huffington, Sophia Marusa. Um, so a lot can be said for just getting influencers involved at the early stages of your content creation. Um, They'll be much more invested once you do publish too. That way it's not like just a random email showing up in their inbox. Hey, I featured you, share my article. Um, yeah. When they're invested from the start, I feel like that's, that's much more of a likelihood that they're going to care about trying to help promote your content. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. All right, so I have a quote from you. This is, don't focus on the negatives. Make a list of the moments, uh, yeah, list of the moments your unique selling style worked or times when you went with your gut and came out with the win. Can you explain this a little bit more? Yeah, I think for me personally, this this is kind of in the context of like pitching freelance services um, okay. more than anything. So what I would say is like, use your own tools and resources to your advantage when you're pitching clients. And for me, like one manifestation of this has always been using my blog as kind of a, a selling platform. So I'll, I'll mention potential clients that I want to work with in the content on my blog. And, you know, am I the most qualified person to be a content marketer for you know, X brand in the world, no way. But by me taking time to provide value, mentioning, you know, this company that I want to work with on my blog and then reaching out that way, um, I'm, I'm able to provide value up front rather than just kind of like cold emailing saying, Hey, hire me. Um, taking the approach of, of doing something cool for them first is a way to kind of like start the relationship off, um, by using like your own unique strength and an asset you have. Okay. That's really interesting. So where do you think the future of content marketing is going in the next couple of years in the next like five or so years? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think honestly it's, it's moving more and more towards video. Um, mm -hmm. Seems that Google also is kind of rewarding um, long form content more and more. That's a trend that's also taking place. Um, okay. I've got an article about the blogging statistics um, pulls together a ton of research on my, on my blog. And it talks about, you know, how over time you can really chart like the course of average length of an article, you know, like 10 years ago, 400 words was like your average article length. And so that's, that's now gone up to something more like 1800 words. Um, yeah. So I, I think that's going to continue to go up. I think the value of video is going to go up. And I think most importantly, um, having video embedded in your blog content. So having a video on the same topic that you just wrote this long article about and having the two come together is going to be increasingly important. What do you recommend like putting in that video? Um, I think it's kind of a, an example um, that you got to look at on a case by case basis, but <laughs> I can give you an example. Um, you know, like I, I had just published something on my blog um, earlier this week, 40 smart ways to grow your blog. Um, and I'm in the process of doing a video for that where I literally just talk through what those 40 ways are. So I think it can be as simple as just like kind of how to instructional. Um, it can be like more tutorial based if it's like a WordPress tutorial of like how to, how to make this tweak to your theme, um, doing kind of like a screen share where you talk through the changes that are being made. Um, yeah, I'd say it kind of depends on what the subject matter is. Okay. So what do you wish all businesses knew about content marketing? 
Ah, that it takes a long time to pay off. I would say I never publish something expecting it to to climb to the top of page one in search results um, in less than six months. If I, if I can get something to rank like at the top and within six months, that's a hell of an accomplishment. It takes a lot of work to do that. Okay. Um, what inspires you to help other bloggers kind of excel in what they're trying to do? I think I see like I've gotten the opportunity to connect with lots and lots of people like individually, um, people that I like chat with on the phone, um, I have in a Slack group, um, chat with over email. And so I, I've identified lots of people that, that I, I kind of feel like are where I was five or six years ago um, and that I want to help. Like I've had lots of people guest post on my blog um, as a way to help like boost their own profiles. I've introduced people to um, the different publications I work for. Um, but I think at the end of the day, honestly, like it, it comes back to kind of a selfish goal of mine to just build relationships with lots and lots of people, um, and have those relationships be meaningful enough that, you know, one day, five, 10, 20, 30, 40 years from now, I might collaborate with these people in some sort of way, whether it's on a, you know, different business venture or, you know, they, they think of me first when there's an opportunity to quote um, a blogger for a, an article they're writing. Um, I think there's just a lot to be said for doing good things for people um, and having those results or that karma kind of come back to you over the years. Okay. So on the note of guest posting, what are your best practices for doing guest posts? I think um, the thing that most bloggers kind of screw up when it comes to guest posting is like just pitching random blogs or accepting, you know, every offer they get for someone that wants them to guest post um, rather than very thoughtfully doing your research and saying like, Hey, like if I get a guest post on this one huge site, um, that's, that's going to be a game changer for me. So I think like taking the time to actually research where you should guest post. Um, and if that site takes guest posts and, you know, read through their details on their, their, um, style guide and make sure that you're actually submitting a, a pitch the way that they want to be pitched. Um, that's my advice. Okay. What do you think the most rewarding part of logging is? Hmm. There are a few things for me personally. Um, now that I'm blogging full time, I feel like the biggest reward for me is that I have such a, a unique level of flexibility in my schedule um, these days to where like, you know, just on Monday earlier this week, I, I was writing this article that I really wanted to publish. It had been on my, you know, editorial calendar for months and mm -hmm. I just slowly writing it. And I like had this crazy productive morning where I wrote like three, 4,000 words, um, and hit publish. And like, as a way to reward myself, I took the rest of the afternoon off, even though it was a Monday where I, you know, kind of traditionally be working, Yeah, uh, having the flexibility to say like, Hey, that was a lot of work you just did. Good job. Take a break. Um, that's been my biggest reward these days. Okay. So what would you, um, say to somebody who's starting into content marketing, like what advice would you give them? Hmm. Aside from choosing like a clear niche, I think the, the most important thing to focus on is just publishing content, um, making it as high quality as you can without like pushing back your deadline to publish it, you know, multiple times. I think getting into kind of a rhythm where you can identify how long it's going to take you to write this two or 3000 word article. Um, but doing the best job that you can and like challenging yourself to publish at regular intervals once you've sort of figured out, um, all right, this is going to take me X number of days or hours. Um, and then, yeah, just getting into a groove, getting comfortable with it. Um, and then eventually, as you start to kind of like grow, balancing very carefully how much time you spend promoting your content versus actually writing. I think once you get a handle on your writing style and regular publishing routine, um, you should then shift over to promoting your content more and, and even, I would say, publishing less if it means spending more time doing guest posts and like reaching out to build partnerships, things like that. All right. Well, Ryan, thank you so much. It was a really interesting point you brought up and I think our audience is really going to love it. So thank you for the time. Yeah. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. All right. Thank you. Thank you.